matter. So, I, I got mixed up with the two, yeah. <coughs> but you should check the strong convergence on the exponent. That is a little more, com I won't say complicated, but little more detailed calculation. Okay, so we had defined a set of operators in the Fox space. <coughs> So we have defined, so let me, the creation operator which I called, so this minus I, I, I wrote here erroneously, so let me write it, So here there is a minus i. Or plus i maybe. Uh, maybe okay. So these three operators we defined where f so here f and g belongs to the base space and capital H is a self adjoint bounded operator in the base space. Well actually you can extend this, so if H in, if T is just a bounded operator not necessarily self adjoint, you extend it by just defining it to be lambda of the real part of T plus I times lambda of the imaginary part of T because each of those pieces are self adjoint so you just extend the definition by the obvious com linear combination now i want to rewrite these things slightly differently but uh, because there were uh, some questions so here i have made the correction that uh, tiju mentioned and here there are some comments the set ef that is the exponential vectors so this is a collection, this is a linear span of the exponential vectors. Let us say for simplicity I take the whole set from the base Hilbert space. Now this is a rather large set, convenient but large. Okay. You cannot for example have any orthonormal vectors in it conveniently. If you orthonormalize by using the standard procedure you lose the exponential character. So you have to choose what you want. So often this is what is called over complete in some sense. And you can see that from this equation. Each of these are eigenvectors of this. Okay. And there are too many eigenvectors. As I said my base space is separable by hypothesis and you can easily show that the Fox space is separable. If the base space is separable, Fox space is separable over it. So these are too many eigenvectors. So that is what I mean by having an over complete set. So these operators are closable, I mean you can and this will be the adjoint of that in the appropriate domain, but I do not want to go to the exact domain of these operators. I do not want to mention it, it can be done, but it is not worth it for our purposes. And then I sort of indicated the computation of this commutation relation. So this is identity in the Fox space, so I called it capital H or sometimes I will call it gamma over the base space, so both notations I will use interchangeably and so this is what I indicated the computation of. Okay. 
Now there are other commutation relations as well. So for example, you would it is of interest to know for example what this is going to be. Okay. The definitions are there, so you just go through it and you can convince yourself. So let me just write it down. Or maybe I put T. So it is an arbitrary bounded operator. Self adjoinedness is dispensed with once we have taken this definition. And Okay, that is the commutation relation between the annihilation and this lambda uh, operator. Okay, and its adjoint also will give you another. So that is not of great interest to write down. Instead, it will be better to write down the commutation relation between lambdas, which is. So commutator of the lambda maps is the map of the commutator. So this is also quite functorial in its uh, nature. So these th sets of commutation relation, this is called the CCR, which I had mentioned, but the whole thing you may call CCR in an extended sense. These you can find in many places, including Parthasarathy's book. Now I want to rewrite this lambda a little differently. So let me choose an orthonormal basis in the base space. indexed by j, then I can rewrite these things by linearity or anti-linearity as the case may be. So you expand the vector f in terms of its Fourier coefficient. Yeah. Yeah, I have written that here. I am defining it like that because first you show that this is a one parameter, this defines a one parameter unitary group on the Fox space. Therefore, by Stone's theorem, it has a generator, self adjoint, and that you call lambda h. For every h, you will find a lambda h. I extend it from self, uh, a priori, it is defined in terms of only self adjoint operator because I need this to be unitary. So, I extend it by this way. I could have done other ways also. It is just one simple way of doing it. That's all. Because it is a bounded operator, I could have instead put a semigroup there generated by H, but you will have a little problem. If it is a contractive semigroup, everything will go through. If it is not contractive, you have to make it contractive by appropriately subtracting appropriate complex number. Okay, coming from the spectrum of the generator. So the, I don't want to go into that. This is much simpler. Okay. Because you have to make, you can only lift it for contractions. So you have to, if you have something which is not contractive, you have to try to convert it into something contractive. Okay. Okay, so here, I use the, uh, the same notation of for the inner product in the base space as well as in the Fox space. Okay, it should be clear in the context. So now I just take it out. Now, remembering the anti-linearity, so there will be a bar here, Ej. Okay, a, this map F to AF is not linear, complex linear. Okay, sorry. A of E j. And this I will call of A sub j. Okay. So for the fixed orthonormal basis E j, A in the base space, A of that vector, 
I will write and shorthand as AJ. So, this is an expansion of this in terms of the Fourier coefficients corresponding to that basis. Similarly, a dagger of course will have a similar expansion, but here it will be linear. I will call it a dagger j, a dagger of E j. Then you can easily see, of course, the, the CCR takes this form now in the basis. Well, maybe I should not use the index j, i should use j, k because the complex number i is going to hang around. Okay. So, that is the delta, Kronecker delta. No, no, I said right in the beginning, the left entry is complex linear for me. You are accustomed to having the right entry complex linear, that is what you are saying. I am using that the left entry, oh, you are right, yes. I think this is correct, yes. Hmm? Oh, yes, yes. Okay. So, this will be a bar here and here it is E j f, yeah, because this is linear that is co complex linear. When you expand, when you expand f, it should be E j f comma e. Yeah, okay, yeah, you are right. Yeah, correct. So, this is linear now, okay, and that is Okay, now we wanted to write lambda h now or lambda, yeah, let us write it for lambda h in terms of this basis, okay, or in terms of a i a j dagger, okay. Let us see how it looks like. It should be easy to find out. So, if I take here e f comma e j, let us compute this inner product by definition which is on the right hand side this is minus i d d t right this will probably become plus i because complex conjugate in the left entry okay now compute the inner product as per the definition and this has to be evaluated at t equal to 0 of course. So, what is this? This is exponential of the inner product of this in the base space. Okay. So, that you can uh, do and come to the following conclusion h f comma g this is the in the base space okay the eyes will balance out right in the right way okay therefore if I expand E f and E g in this basis, then you will be able to find so the expand the right hand side and well, let me give the result. I mean, it's quite an elementary computation because E f and E g you expand as we have done earlier and you will get this equality. So, it will you will ob obtain the following expression lambda h is equal to double sum j k e j h e k e 
ए आई डैगर ए जे सॉरी जे डैगर के दैट इज वॉट यू विल गेट इन टर्म्स ऑफ दैट बेसिस इज ए डबल सम ना ऑफकोर्स आई हैव डन इंटरचेंजेस एटसेट्रा क्वाइट फ्रीली बट यू कैन क्वाइट इजिली प्रूव दैट दिस सम कन्वर्जेस स्ट्रॉगली ऑन द एक्सपोनशियल वैक्टर स्पेस एक्सपोनशियल सेट यू डोंट एक्सपेक्ट इट टू कन्वर्ज एवरीवेयर Do you understand that you don't expect this right hand sum to converge on the whole Hilbert space, whole Fock space, because these are unbounded operators, all of them. This also, though the H is bounded, lambda H is not bounded. Okay. Take H to be identity, the simplest <laughs> bounded operator, and calculate it. in fact we will need that so this is an unbounded operator so you have to say what do you mean by the right hand side and it convert you can show easily the right hand side converges strongly on exponential domain this has a name this operator various authors have given various uh, names i think parthasarathy gives the name uh, i think i mean conservation is one name some people use but number is a better name in my view but anyway it's not so important now we'll see later in what sense this object is a laplacian in infinite dimension because that is one of our goals so so this is one possible there are infinite number of directions because the base space is infinite dimensional so you have infinite number of coordinate directions and this is something which uh, has to do with all the possible coordinate directions okay uh, sir uh, i have a question uh, when you uh, say that the base space is infinite dimension the base space is hilbert space and uh, the base space is infinite so even if we start by uh, r3 or something like that and we can take the base space to be l2 r3 it will still be infinite dimensional but r3 is three dimensional so when you are talking about the base space what do you mean by the base base space is this h uh, so base right. space cannot be I, i'm assuming base space is infinite dimension okay so obviously it cannot be r3 it has you can take it to be l2 of r3 no problem no problem but that has infinite number of uh, orthonormal directions so when you go to the uh, this operator this will also have infinite number of directions in which you will have to sum it up okay so the fox space well over for example c take the one dimensional base space nothing could be simpler okay what is the fox space over it l2 okay so the base space is one dimensional but fox space is infinite dimensional already but here of course i am taking base space itself to be infinite dimension okay so base space could be l2 itself for example small l2 okay so looking at this expression we want to look at another operator which as i said goes because gross introduced it in a different context entirely different context but it is the same object and it has come to be called gross laplacian which i mean i'll keep the notation of the usual laplacian and g 
for gross okay and i will put an operator here t so delta gt is the gross laplacian what is t t is an operator in the base space let me see it is a bounded operator of course like h or t earlier so there i had h or t as the case may be uh, in the base space here also similarly i fix an operator in base space and try to define an object in the fox space which goes under the name of gross laplacian again i want to define it formally you sort of look at this and so this is a base space uh, inner product so these are both annihilation operator here one creation one annihilation so there you can sort of, you are sort of restoring the balance that's why it is called conservation okay so one you annihilate another you create so you some sense you are keeping the balance here you are far from it you are actually annihilating twice okay so this is had they been differential operators they are kind of differential operators they would have, so this is quadratic this is also quadratic so let us see how to make sense of it in fact did i write it correctly no i did not let me uh here i'll put a bar that means this bar means this following the base space so we have to assume has a complex conjugation map abstractly speaking in function space it is obvious this is the usual complex conjugation if your base space is l2 of r or r3 then this complex conjugation map is obvious but abstractly you have a complex conjugation map in the hilbert space which takes one vector to another vector which changes the linearity anti linearity for example that means this will give a real inner product okay so this is that bar means you apply the complex conjugation map to the vector t a e j okay i do not introduce another notation that's all i just keep the same notation as if i am taking conjugation of complex numbers which it is the case if they are function spaces okay well if you well with apology to professor varshik because i i asked right in the beginning that this what i'm going to describe can be uh, i mean at least motivated by from probability theory but the audience mostly uh, wanted a more analytic uh, description so i am not using any uh, or i using minimal number of words from probability but this probably under, can be understood nicely from probabilistic point of view as well okay, th that uh, i will say a little bit when the time comes so first thing as there you have to show that the right hand side converges strongly somewhere so this is again an exercise on again e it's not a problem to approve this it is quite elementary what goes wrong is if i want to find an adjoint of this and that's where you face the first difficulty with this operator here you see the advantage is sorry 
lambda. La uh, lambda was here somewhere here. Here you don't face that difficulty. But take a formal adjoint. Okay, formally you will just take the adjoint of this. A k will come here. It becomes a k dagger a j. Now j and k are interchangeable except that this will become a complex conjugate of the previous number. That's all will happen. You will get back the same expression. And if h is self-adjoint, this will be self-adjoint, at least formally. Okay, so there is no issue of taking the adjoint, or at least the adjoint is. I mean, this appears to be self-adjoint if h is self-adjoint. Okay, but that is not true in the case of this. That is clear. Okay, so what do we do? Okay, first thing is to let us see how what it does to exponential vectors. Uh, somewhere I had, I never wrote it, is it? Okay, maybe I should write that as well. So, what does lambda h do? EF, okay, let us uh, note that. That is also quite simple. From the definition, either you can use any of them. For example, this one. Okay. Oh, sorry. Actually. Better to write here E G. Now what happens? So this is just to give a reference to what happens to the gross Laplacian. You see this one I can compute. So let us put down formally the sum. There it is and compute. And you will find that this is So this is also an eigenvector in some sense with this eigenvalue. Okay. Now that's okay, but how to compute the adjoint of it? That is the next problem. And formally, the adjoint of it is look like if you take the formal adjoint, you get two creation operators and that is the source of the problem. This is not defined. There is no reasonable domain on which it is defined, okay, except for very small domains. So you have to do a little bit of surgery. And this is how you go about it. Yeah. What happens to the bar inside the Yeah, that's why this has come to the right side. Okay. 
Oh yeah, that should have been there, yes. So I want to now look at, so let T not only bounded, but a Hilbert-Schmidt operator in the underlying Hilbert space. So I make it a little more restricted, namely a Hilbert-Schmidt operator, okay. Then what happens, and consider, so I want to make a map from here, okay. So what is this map? So if T is Hilbert Schmidt, then T has a canonical decomposition, right? Let's say Fj. So lambda j's are the singular values of the operator, okay? And Ej, so singular value means that is the eigenvalues of t star t to the power half, right? That is singular value. Fj's are the eigenvectors associated with that. And Ej's are the range of T on those eigenvectors. Okay, those eigenvectors, remember, are eigenvectors of T star T. So you have this, this is the polar or canonical decomposition of a compact operator, it always looks like that. Okay. Now I think I should change this because there is an Ej already there. So maybe. Now, what, what does this notation mean? This is a rank one map. So, this is a notation which comes from, again, physicists. If you take a vector h in the base space, then this, by definition, this means inner product of g with h times f. So, it is antilinear here, linear there. So, this is the definition of this notation. It is a rank one map with the range given by this vector. Okay. Once you have that, then so you see every Hilbert Schmidt operator admits this because it is a compact operator, admits this with a further proviso the Hilbert Schmidt nature has to reflect somewhere and that is the summability of the square of these singular values. Okay? That is the consequence of Hilbert Schmidt. Given that, you think of this, so this you associate, so this rank 1 vector you associate with the following <coughs> tensor product of h bar cross h. So this sits in h bar cross h. h bar is that complex conjugate Hilbert space. Okay? For every vector, you take the complex conjugate correspondent. And this is a sum of those kinds of vectors. Further condition is that these coefficients are all square summable. Okay? Therefore, you have actually a one-to-one -one correspondence from B2 of H, H bar tens, tensor H. It's just another way of saying the same thing. Okay. Now here, there is a slight difference, notice, because that T bar, T E bar was coming. So it is not complex conjugated here, it is just the Hilbert space 
with Hilbert space and I have a symmetrization as well, okay. Yeah. Because every element here, okay, will can be written this way with the coefficient square summable, okay. Oh, I have something there. So with that understanding, I can associate with T, which is in B2 of H, with, so T, with something I call tau T, sometimes people call it a trace, I, I don't know why they call it a trace, it's not a good terminology, but people do. In this case, I will put it, as I said, I'll symmetrize it further. Then, so for every such operator, I can do, look at the vector, consider the vector So, I am considering a vector in the Fox space, okay, in the space with the base small h. So, I have to give elements in each sector, okay. I start with 0 in the 0th sector, in the first sector, 0 in the, also in the second sector, and here I put tau t, that is the third sector or physicists call them here, this is the vacuum sector, as I already mentioned. This is the one particle sector, this is the physicist terminology, and so on. This is the two particle sector, and so on. Okay. So, next one is three, and so on. Let me write down the three, third one. Okay, there is a certain normalization factor, which I should write down. Because I symmetrize it, oh, it, here it doesn't appear. Next one, it will appear. So I will have to symmetrize it. Take an element f in the base space. So f is in the base space. Okay. So this is I identify in here. Okay. So this is already in the sector two. That is, I have a tensor product of two elements. I am bringing a third element here. So I have to symmetrize it to make it live in Fox space. So this circle S means symmetrized tensor product, okay. Here I will put three factorial, three, yeah, three factorial times this and here, okay, so I will give the generic term which is this n plus two factorial over n factorial that comes from the symmetrization and then yes that tau t symmetrized tensor product of f n fold tensor product okay so what it has done it has shifted the the vector so what is the vector you first start with one then start with f then start with f square and so on okay so it shifts it in place of one you get tau t the first entry is in the second component it is zero before second component then sorry third component and fourth component it takes the tau t and makes a symmetrized product with f and so on okay and this is just the combinatorial factor that appears when you want to make the inner product and yeah well here there is a remember there is a I am taking exponential vector so generic vector will fn over square root of n factorial will be there okay yeah actually I have lost that the identification with tau t t goes to tau t that ah that one yeah just here. For every t has this canonical decomposition. Every term you look as an element of h tensor h. So only thing you do is symmetrize it, that's all. 
right? This you can think of as I said. The G bar F, right? G bar because it is uh, antilinear in uh, left variable for me. Okay. So this is a very basic fact that B two of H. Firstly, B two of H is a Hilbert space under the inner product given by the trace. Okay. And as Hilbert space, you identify this identification. This is an iso isometric isomorphism of Hilbert spaces for any Hilbert Schmidt operator. So B two H is isometrically isomorphic. to as Hilbert spaces, okay. Because that is a straightforward, that is a basic straightforward observation. <coughs> so here what we have done, this bar has gone firstly and that is because of that bar there, T E J bar. I anticipate that, so I put another bar which by which I, it means H tensor H. So that complex conjugation, conjugation is lost. Or in other words, the inner product, when you define the inner product on the left hand side, so what is the inner product in the left hand side? Usually it is A star B, that is the usual inner product in the Hilbert Schmidt operator space. But here, I am just putting this, or rather I should say, well, for lack of any better notation, I will write that. Say real inner product. That is the only change that has taken place. And then symmetrization because I want to bring it back to Fox space, that is why symmetrization. You first identify it, then you symmetrize it. Okay? Got it? Because of that bar there, you are able to identify HS tensor H. No, that I do. Why do I do that? Because I have that. So I my aim to introduce this, this vector, there is an ulterior motive. I introduce this vector because as I said, I want to take the adjoint of that. And if I look at it this way, this one, this is not defined. So I am trying to make, a, make it defined. If I put the additional hypothesis that T is not just bounded, but Hilbert Schmidt, then I can define it. That is what I am trying to go towards. Okay. Remember when I first defined it, that one, T was just a bounded operator. I did not put any further restriction on it. And gross Laplace n is well defined when T is just a bounded operator. But its adjoint is not defined. So I want to re uh, make it a smaller subclass of B of H, so that the adjoint is also defined. What is that smaller subclass? Hilbert Schmidt. Okay. That is the what is going to be the observation. Here I have started with the known product, namely I have to look at this vector. I will soon show that you define it, this is the range of the that joint. That is what I am going to next do. So first I define the uh, gross Laplacian for arbitrary bounded operators, then I restrict it further to Hilbert Schmidt operators. For which the gross Laplacian is defined as I stated, this is something you should check as I keep on saying, prove the strong convergence on exponential vector. So it has a good domain, okay. But its adjoint may not have a good domain. In order for the adjoint to have a good domain, you put further restriction on the operator t. That is what it is, right? Do you understand the logic of it? That is what it… 
that's what you, you will see No, no, that is a minor problem. That is because of complex conjugation, because of this, okay, because of the conventional inner product, okay, because you want a complex linear inner product. You want a sesquilinear form. That's why. Which one? Yes. For each element, you have this identification. Yes. So this will give you the, for arbitrarity what is the identification. In other words, this is, this is uh, quite. So what is the identification? If you make an identification map, that's what it is. Yes, that, no, there are two things. One is I take away this bar, okay, other is symmetrization. So I write, to make this go into the Fox space, I will have to look at the symmetrized product here. That's the next thing. Like tot is the symmetrized version of this one. No, tot, yes, tot is the symmetrized version. But when I put another f, I have to symmetrize further. Because I have destroyed the symmetry by adding another f. So I have to keep on symmetrizing it. You see a symmetric vector, when you tensor with another vector, that product is not symmetric. You have destroyed the symmetry by bringing another vector. So you have to again restore the symmetry, symmetrize it. It is like taking f tensor g you symmetrize it, f tensor g plus g tensor f and divide by the factor, certain factor to keep the norms same level and, and so this is the commutatorial factor that is coming from that, the counting factor. Okay. So first thing we have to prove of course that this is a vector in the Fox space. I have just written it down. God knows from where, but just write it down. So you see, if I put okay, for n equal to 0, this gives you tau t. Okay? For n equal to 1, it gives you this 3 factorial or 3. Okay? So that is the shifting going on and so on for n equal to 4 and so on. So now let me No, I'm sorry. I should just, that will come in the norm. Yes. Automatically it will come in the norm. So here you will have tau t by 1 by uh, 3 factorial square root. And here you will have 1 by n factorial square root. So what is the norm of that vector? So let me give a name to that vector. Some... Uh, S T. So what is the Fock norm of this vector? So first one is tau t 2 tau t norm square. So that is a factorial square root of Because in the norm definition, there is this factorial, so that's why that shows up in 2. So these numbers will keep appearing. So this is 3 factorial tau t. Because when you take the symmetrized vectors norm square, they will, uh, this factor will come. 
because you have to do the counting. So this is how this will come. You see, this is an isometric isomorphism that I mentioned here. And what is the again comes from that the Hilbert Schmidt norm of the operator is just the sum of lambda j square. Okay, that is just the trace of the t star t, which is means the sum of the eigenvalues of t star t, which means the sum of the singular values square, right? But this is also the Hilbert space norm square. So that's why it is isometric isomorphism. Okay. It's a trivial thing using the orthonormality of these sets. Right? Because this is a canonical decomposition. These are the orthonormalized basis vector, uh, the eigenvectors, uh, or these are the eigenvectors, these are the range. They are also orthonormal. They are not complete, but they are orthonormal. You have to use the orthonormality to compute the norm square of this, and that will give you again the same sum square. That's what leads to this isometry. And therefore, this so this sum is less than equal to the Hilbert Schmidt norm square times. I mean, this is an estimate n plus two factorial divided by n factorial square norm f to the two n, and that is finite. So problem comes from this one, but that is uh, luckily doesn't grow fast enough compared to the denominators to be summable. So this vector belongs to the Fox space. And then I will show. No, I don't want to wipe this one. Now I am ready to define the adjoint. So fix a t which is Hilbert Schmidt. Okay. Define the delta g t as that. That is well defined for every t in bounded operator, in particular for Hilbert Schmidt. Now, so the definition of the, so I write dagger like a dagger, etc acting on EF, the exponential vector is defined as this, that vector, except I change T to T bar as I have been saying, that is why I have taken away the H bar in this isomorphism. How is T bar defined? T bar on say, vector xi is equal to T on vector xi bar. Oh, xi bar, that is the definition of t bar. Okay. Do you see that? You have a basic complex conjugation map in the Hilbert space. So, you know what a xi bar is. Now, you let t act on xi bar and take the bar of that image. Okay. That you define as t bar acting on xi. Okay. Yes, t bar, tau t bar, so symmetrize product with f and so on as I have written. So that vector is the range of this. Now this is well defined in the Fox space. So that is the first thing I checked that this is well defined in the Fox space. This defines a vector in the Fox space 
for every f in the base space and for every t which is Hilbert Schmidt. All you have to show this is indeed that joint on the exponential vector space. So verify that because delta was defined on the exponential vector space, right? That delta g t e f e g is equal to delta g t dagger e g e f. Once you have got exponential vectors in the domain, in order to put the exponential vectors in the domain, I had to restrict the t. That is essentially the bottom line. Okay. Once we have done, done that, then of course we want to ask what are the so called commutation relations. So let me and the commutation relations are so Joydev, I am probably do not need the projector today, next lecture maybe, because I have not come to the integration theory yet. So So delta G T dagger on E F is equal to this infinite sum E J T E I bar A dagger, well let me call it K, A dagger K, A dagger J. This sum again converging, the sum right hand side converges strongly on the exponential vectors if t belongs to B2H, otherwise it does not. Yeah. Whereas this one converges for every t B of H, this one does not. In general, this is a sort of thumb rule that the accretion operators are worse behaved as operator than annihilation operator. Okay. In some sense, creating is always difficult than destroying. Take that in many context, context including our national context. <laughs> okay. So let me just write down the commutation relations involving the gross Laplacian. So this is the definition of gross Laplacian and it is adjoint. So you can do this calculation, similar type of calculation now involving the gross Laplacian. Now you have everything to compute and this is what you get. So first is an inhalation operator with the gross Laplacian. So that is how the t operator t affects the vector f in the commutator. And similarly, so with the lambda, oh, so I have to give a different name here, two different operators. That is the operator here in the gross Laplacian adjoint is the commutator between t bar and k, which is of course Hilbert Schmidt because k is Hilbert Schmidt. So all this, well, whenever I write, I write gross Laplacian, you assume k to be Hilbert Schmidt. 
oh sorry this is should be dagger yeah. and finally gross laplacian with itself i mean adjoint okay so you have a one gross laplacian and you have another it's adjoint with another operator so these two operators may, may be different but of course both hilbert schmidt And this is the one which is quite interesting for many reasons. This is trace. So this is a number. So you get the lambda operator here, lambda of k2 bar k1, which is a bounded operator. But here you get twice the trace sorry one is missing k1 bar times k2 so that's a number okay and the trace exists because k1 k2 are hilbert schmidt okay so that these are the new commutation relations so these i won't call ccrs i don't know what to call it doesn't matter now i may comment that this these operators were known and used by physicists i would guess at least 50 years back if not more okay uh, in many many formal calculations they they, they did use these operators uh, even higher order ones but higher order ones that means you have more than one uh, two three four five six uh, you know any number but they are very difficult to make sense of in fact they are impossible to make sense of that is they cannot live in fox space that is the point you have to go out of the fox space to make sense of any arbitrary monomials in aa daggers okay so up to quadratic either annihilation or creation or any combination you can accommodate in the fox space for higher monomials you have to leave the fox space you have to go in a bigger space which i will not describe uh, but many things can be done but if you want to live in the fox space and i will explain the reason why you want to live in the fox space uh maybe in next talk or maybe the one after because after this next thing to do is to develop what is called the theory of integration with respect to these objects so our aim is to define definite integrals of the following type you have so these are what are these these are increments of a so take the function characteristic of so i will for application i will fix the base space as l2 of r plus like he was saying l2 of r3 but i will have r plus because r plus is the essentially something like time okay so r plus will play the role of time so base space is l2 of r plus these then you see a of the characteristic function 0 to t is suddenly in l2 of r plus that about therefore it makes sense and increments of it which means t plus delta t minus a of characteristic function of 0 to t we have to make sense of that this increment of this operator valued function those are the integrators and this is the integrand it is an operator valued integrand so i want to do integration of operator valued integrand with respect to operator valued in integrator okay and so i will go through the list so a a dagger then lambda so what is lambda so here i have to put an operator right lambda depends on an operator family right so i will put the same characteristic function but now i am looking at it as a multiplication operator in the l2 of r plus i can look at the characteristic function in two ways 
one as a vector, other as a projection operator, right. So, for the lambda I look at it as a projection operator in L2 of R plus and finally, the gross Laplacian. So, here I have to put a Hilbert Schmitt operator, okay. So, that an Hilbert Schmitt operator in L2 of R plus because I have chosen the base space to be L2 of R plus. Now, this is a well known thing that every Hilbert Schmitt operator in an L2 space is isometrically isomorphic to an integral square integrable integral of integral operator with square integrable kernel. So, I will use the square integrable kernel, okay. So, here will be a function of two variables which is square integrable into variables, okay. And with respect to these things, I, I, I will have to define this integral. That is the next topic. Question?